another episode of American Reef. Today we're here with Mike Paletta again. And Mike, tell us what we're going to do today. Today we're going to set up a new 75-gallon tank. Actually, it's an old 75-gallon tank that I've now retrofitted for doing something new. Um, started trying a tank with LED lights. I have an Aqua X uh, return. I have a new Cad Light skimmer. Mm -hmm. I'm putting all the new toys on it to try and play with it. And I'm using uh, cultured rock, basically man-made rock instead of stuff out of the ocean. Uh, I'm still using the ecosystem and a skimmer, but it's going to be a uh, LPS and uh, a couple of uh, stony corals, because I love stony right. corals, as you right. saw downstairs, right, right, right. Uh, but mostly LPS, and basically I'm going to try and do it in a smaller scale than I've done before. Okay, so yeah, tell me what's your goal, in other words, besides obviously having a place to put all those thousands of frags. Yeah, well, that's part of it, is I have to thin downstairs, so I have to bring it up here, right. but I also want to play with the LED lights, because I know everybody's hot on them. I want to see what they do, I want to see the growth, and I'll be able to compare them, because a lot of the frags will come from frags that are under metal halides, right, right. so I'll see what they look like, how they grow, everything that's going with them, and basically it's a comparison tank, because okay. all the parameters right. are going to be the same, mm -hmm. still going to have uh, GFO for taking out phosphate, a carbon filter, an ecosystem, so everything's going to be equivalent in that regard, the only thing that's going to really be different is the lighting, Sure. so it's pretty much a experiment. Right, right. Is this lighting superior, equal, better, right, worse right, whatever. than metal halides? So, I mean, I'll be able to take two frags. I'll take a photograph of them and say, look, here's one of the metal halides. Here's one of the LEDs. Right. This is after six months. This is how much this one grew. This is how much this one grew. Right. And we'll be able to see the differences. Yeah, you've got the same colony, so you're all kind of on that same Yeah, population. I mean, I'm always experimenting and trying new stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously this isn't new, but it's still relatively new. Right. And, I mean, there's a lot of different LEDs out there, and I, I picked the... Uh, uh, aqua Illuminator yep. soles, primarily because I like the blue from them, and they also produce a ton of par. So right, right. that's the whole thing, and that way I can keep some SPS in here, <laughs> but uh, the LPS and the chalices and the right. uh, euphilias and the things that I love, right. they're getting too big downstairs I can put up here as well. So Okay, so goal of the experiment, you're going to experiment with LED, so we can actually do it over time too as well. So we'll have the day in the beginning, maybe six months, 12 months, because like everything else, time is wonderful. Yeah, and I also to stress that you, you don't have to do this fast. Right. I mean, I've had the live rock curing for three weeks, the bio balls are taken from my tank downstairs, everything has been around for a while, but I'm not putting fish in this today. Right. Basically, right. I'm doing is getting it up and running, it'll run for a week or two, and then I'll start adding stuff. But I want to make right. sure everything's working perfectly, which a lot of us neglect. We want to put stuff in immediately, right. and after watching the show Tanked on TV, <laughs> that's not what my goal is. And my goal is not to have a tank set up with 50 big angel fish in it today. It's to have a nice, small, happy little tank in a couple right. weeks, and six months, a year from now, it's still a happy right. tank that requires a minimal amount of maintenance. Right. That's the other thing. Right. I'm not looking to have to do a ton of work in this tank. Because when I had this up as a freshwater tank, it was a plant tank, and it was like gardening. Right. It was always cutting, right. pruning. Right. It's, I, I like my reef tank downstairs. Other than cleaning the glass and cleaning the skimmer, there's not a lot of work involved with it. Right. So right. it's enjoyable. Okay, so perfect. So in other words, this episode, we're going to set up, and it's a 75 gallon, right? Right. So you're going to set up a 75 with all the latest, greatest kind of technology out there with the end goal of saying, hey, does LED work? Or maybe not work is a good choice. What is the comparison between LED and metal halide? What's the difference? Right. What's the difference in terms of coloration of the corals? Because yep. for those of us to keep SPS and LPS, the whole joy of them is their colors. Right, right. Because, I mean, I picked up a couple of corals yesterday, and in the dealer's tanks, they were kind of drab, and now they're under LEDs downstairs, and, I mean, the colors are just so vibrant. I'm right. going, and I got them really cheap because they didn't look like anything right. in the dealer's tank. So, right. is, and uh, there was actually just an article, is it the lights or is it right. the corals changing color? And actually they came to the conclusion it's both. So this will show whether it's both or sure. not because I'll be able to take stuff out of here, take stuff out of downstairs, put it in sunlight, yep, yep. and see the difference. Yep, exactly. Okay, perfect. So let's get started then, and we'll take a moment for a break, and then we'll come back. Okay. First of all, Mike, tell me, where do you start on something like this? Well, I sit down and write what I want to do and what my what equipment I need. 
Then I basically review and talk to my friends and see what they recommend. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to Sanjay about the LED lights. He liked mm -hmm. a couple of them, but basically found that these have the most par of anything he's tested to date. Right. So this is what I went with. Uh, then I came up with trying to find the manufacturers for the equipment I want to fit in the space and for the cost that I wanted. Yeah. I mean, obviously I, I could spend $10,000 on a skimmer, <laughs> but I went with the CAD lights because it was reasonable and it seems to do what I wanted it to do. Right. Because right. one of the things I will do in this tank is overstock it with fish because that's <laughs> what I always do, but it will be overstocked with small fish right, versus right. downstairs. So there will be, you know, right. red spot cardinals and Yasuhashi gobies and stuff like that in here. So there will be some neat little fish in here. And that's one of the reasons for this tank. Right. Uh, I put small fish in the 300 gallon tank, they disappear. In here, I can see them, I can keep track of them. It's, it's a lot easier to maintain right. small fish in a smaller tank. Right, right. So what I'm doing now, uh, I, plan, I got this uh, uh, sump online. I modified it somewhat in that I added some egg crate to hold bio balls because that'll be the first chamber primarily to cut down on splash and noise. Mm -hmm. Because one of the other factors with this tank is I want it to be as quiet as possible because it's sitting right next to my TV room. And one of the reasons I took down the old tank, it was a constant hum and buzz. Right. And it's somewhat annoying when you have 12 people trying to watch a football game or a movie and there's <laughs> ee. So that's one of the things I did. Uh, the other thing is I've modified it by also putting strips in across the bottom for the ecosystem mud so that the mud doesn't all push up against one side. Uh, this is different than what Ling su suggests. Ling always likes to just go with the ecosystem, but he's now doing experiments where he's comparing four different tanks with four different filtration systems. One's just uh, ecosystem, one's just Berlin, and then there's modified of what he calls the Paletta system, right. which is a ecosystem mud and a skimmer. So what's interesting is he has people that don't know what he's doing come in and compare what the tanks look like. Right. And to date, the system with the ecosystem and the skimmer, to his chagrin, right. like that system the best. So that's what I've been using now for the last uh, 15 years. Right, right. So I'm pretty happy that the system works and I haven't had any problems. I mean, a lot of people still poo-poo, you shouldn't right. be doing mud or refugium, right. but it works. My fish keep their coloration, my corals show great polyp sure. extension. Sure. So that's why I'm doing this. So let's talk about that for a second. In other words, okay, like you had just said, there's a way to do it, right? And so let's talk about your way of how you implement that system. In other words, we had talked about the bio balls earlier. Like right. The, these, well, one of the other things I'm doing in this tank, is, as I said, is I'm using man-made rock. And the man-made rock doesn't have all the nooks and crannies that regular live rock does. So in addition to this cutting down the noise and splash, it also causes more, allows for more biological filtration. Now, these aren't going to be a trickle filter where they're going to be exposed to air. They're going to be underwater, so they're just going to be another surface for uh, bacteria to grow on. Right, right. So they're going to be in the first chamber. Then it's going to pass through. Part of the water is going to pass through to the skimmer. Some of it's going to go just straight through through an ecosystem section, then back to the pump and back up. And the pump I'm going to use is an Eheim 1260 because mm -hmm. that's what's recommended for the Aqua X uh, return system. Good deal. And what's interesting about the return system is, I already tested this, uh, it has no moving parts to it, but because of how it's designed, the uh, return actually pulsates the water. So it's a mechanical kind of? It's not mechanical. It's really? it's. For some reason, the water sort of backs up and then just pulses really? out. Yeah, and when you see it, it's uh, yeah, be cool. It's not something I've seen before, yeah. but it's, it's once again, it, it's something that won't break because there's no moving parts. Right, right. right. And it's quiet. And th the other reason I chose it is I didn't want to lose space in the tank because to me, a 75 yes. is a small tank. Yes. After having a 1200 and a 300, <laughs> so I didn't want a big hole in a section of the tank, so that just flows over the back and down into the sump. Right, right. Perfect. Okay, so get started. Then. So the bio balls are just going in the first chamber. And now you said you had the bio balls already inoculated, right? They've been sitting in uh, my 300 gallon tank for the past two to three weeks. Some of them longer, some of them a little shorter, but they're pretty coated with bacteria and everything else. And there's a lot of animals living in them. And so now is there a, any rhyme or reason to how many bio balls? I'm just trying to fill up the chamber, you know, two yeah. Two thirds to three quarters of the way full. Just as I said, the main thing is noise and splash, but also I'll have more than enough uh, bacterial surface area. Now, when you were doing this, did you ever consider using like the ceramic balls that exist out there? With I did those, but they tended to accumulate more detritus because they sat on the bottom. Yep. Versus these float a little bit. Yep. Yep. So if I need to clean this out, all I got to do is uh, stick a hose down on the bottom and siphon out the bottom. Okay. Very good. So I. 
one of the rules of setting up a reef tank is make stuff as simple and as easy to do because then you're more likely to do it. <laughs> if it's hard and a pain in the ass, you tend not to right, do right, it. Right. And it's just human nature. I mean, if you have a uh, something that needs clean and it takes you two hours to do it versus something that takes five minutes, right. you may do the five-minute one every week. The two-hour one you may do once a year. All right. So try to make your life as simple as you can when you do this because yep. in the long run, and I mean, that's what I'm setting this up for. I'm not setting this up for two weeks. It's not a TV set. This is something that's going to be here hopefully for the next five or ten years. Those are all in. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to drain the mud and then put the mud in. And unlike what Ling suggests, I soak the mud in fresh water for a day, pour that off because it pours off all the extra whatever's in it. Right, right. The fine particulates and stuff. Then I soak it in tank water for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. It sits at the bottom now. I'll put it in. I'll put water in it. And by the time I turn the tank on, it'll be settled down. Ling just says dump it in and pour the water in. Right. Well, you end up with a, a rusty tank for like six hours. So right. I like to see what's going on in the tank as quick sure. as I can. Sure. So by doing this, I cut down on some time. I mean, it's easy to do. And so now if you're a new hobbyist, right, and you don't have a, an existing tank or tank water. What you you still can mix up salt water and put it in. Or okay. you can even just use fresh water. Okay. But I've always found it's better off just to mix it up and have it wet when you pour it in yep. versus dry. Yep. It just seems to work a lot better and doesn't. You, you pour off a lot of nasty stuff. Right, That's right. just uh, my opinion. But right, exactly. It's just what it is. It's different than Ling's. Ling's thinks it's all good. I think it's, there's some bad it's stuff nasty. in it. Yeah. <laughs> inches of sand on the bottom, mud on the bottom. Not much more than that, not much less. That seems to be the level that works best for me. And then I'll add Calerpa to this from downstairs and this will be ready to go. I mean you don't have to smooth it because once the water starts flowing across it, it'll take care of that. And so I know one of his instructions when you fill it up with water to use uh, you know, a plastic bag on top of it. Water yeah, what I'm going to do is add the rest of the water to the here and it's just going to flow across it. There you go, so then you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm getting the Eheim 1260 ready to run up to the return. This is the pump that they recommend, plus it's very quiet. And as I said, that's one of the main considerations for this. It has to be quiet. Now I noticed again you're using not hard piped PVC kind of stuff, just regular. This is the pipe that came with the overflow. Got it, got it. Oh, it just sits it in the, be quiet, right? I tested it downstairs and it I have five of these and this was the quietest one. Okay. You know, everyone talks how quiet everything is, and everything's quiet the first day you use it. But, <laughs> right. I mean, I've had so many pumps over the years and over time in salt water. The bearings all tend to go and they get noisy, so right, right. not what I want. So basically this is the return. Okay. Nothing real elaborate, it just sits on the back of the overflow. Okay. And it just hooks up here. I will eventually clamp it. So I was going to ask, are you going to clamp it? Or? Yeah, it's not high pressure, but typically when I go on vacation is when the clamps fall off. So right, right. These will be clamped. What is that, inch and a half? Yeah. And I think the 1260s rated for between four and 500 gallons an hour. I never fully believe the ratings. Right, right. They're a certain amount of head and a certain distance, and unless you're perfect, they change. So it'll be close. So what are you doing, Mike? I'm just filling up the bottom to live, let the mud settle out for a while. Yeah. And then once the mud settles out, this over here. So salt, use the regular uh, instant ocean. Instant ocean. Yeah. 
And I've been using Instant Ocean forever. I've never had problems with it. Yep. Uh, I mean, if I want to add stuff, I add magnesium or I add calcium, but for the most part, it's and pretty s stable. And now that's Instant Ocean Re crystal? Re uh, or plain? Plain. There you go. I mean, the plain has added calcium, added magnesium, but you can add that yourself, and so right. I haven't really seen a reason to. Yeah, I've been running the test for like eight months now. Yeah. You know, exactly the same way. So you can see how much stuff's coming up the mud, off the mud, even though it was sit, yep, sitting yep, for a while. Yep. The other thing I realize I have to do now is I have to cut this overflow hose some because it's just too long. Ah. Now, are you going to have any kind of sock or anything in there to catch it or no. to hold it? You're just going to let it sit? I'm just going to sit in the bio balls and it'll just shoot down in that. Okay. I'm cutting the hose now because it's just a little too long. Because you want it to sit flush in there. You don't want it flapping around in the where it's coming down. Because that's just a potential for major problems. Got it. So now it's sitting all the way in the bottom. Now I'm going to add a uh, rockwork structure. I'm uh, basically using the design uh, developed by Sanjay Joshi where he takes uh, paving stones, puts a fiberglass rod in them, you glue them in. I use, uh, you can either use epoxy, uh, I use actually uh, gel type super glue to hold uh -huh. them in. Uh -huh. You don't even really need to if it's tight and you have to really push them in. Uh -huh. They're not really going to go anywhere, particularly on a smaller tank. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing a big tank, a 1200 gallon tank where they'll be glued right, in because right, right. I really don't want them moving around. But for this tank, the other thing I did is I put silicone on the bottom so that it sits kind of flush and tight so I don't get any dead spaces or a lot of detritus accumulating underneath. Sure, sure. And then you mask it by putting sand all around it and you don't even see the rocks. Mm -hmm. And if I do my job right, you won't even see the fiberglass rods right. coming through. And the way I pack stuff in, you eventually yeah. won't see anything. And the corals will grow in and fill it all in. But it also allows a lot more open structure. Mm -hmm. It's not really rock sitting on rock because as I'll demonstrate, it's basically rock sitting on a pole hiding the pole but slightly touching. Right. Now, uh, these are all pre-drilled, but what I did was you don't want just drilling in the middle and setting them on top of each other. That doesn't accomplish anything. So what you do is you take a large flat piece, cut through the edge, put it one way, put another one another way. It gives you a lot more open structure, a lot more things to place corals on, which is what we all want. Right, right. And you build some of those, but then you also put rock on top of those structures to finish it out. Uh -huh. So that gives you a lot more open structure than what we used to do. I used to build everything on a PVC skeleton, right. which gave the same effect. But what happens is when you have an open structure with a lot of caves and a lot of overhangs, yeah. it's weird because the fish feel more comfortable, so they come out more. Where before we used just to have a rock face where they really couldn't get back in the crevices and stuff, they all hid there all the time. Right, right. Now that they know there's a place to go, they're out all the time. I mean, it's kind of interesting, but right. it's, a, it's a lot easier for the fish to feel comfortable in a tank where there's places to hide readily right. than where they have to find them. Right. And after they're in there for a week or two, they know where every cave and nook and cranny <laughs> right, is, right. so they come out even more. Do you do anything to kind of clean them, make sure there's no chemicals from a plant or anything like that? Uh, they've basically have been sitting outside all winter when okay. I got them now. Yep. So they've been washed pretty good by snow and rain. Right, right. And most of them are all stored outside. You can get them at any uh, big box. Sure. Uh, like the Lowe's, Home Depot. Yeah, stuff. they all have them. Right. And you drill them with a half-inch bit and a half-inch fiberglass rod, and that's basically all you need. And now they have the fiberglass rods? Fiberglass rods you have to order online. Okay. Uh, I can't remember the name. It's the McConnell car or McAllister car. Okay. Uh, but if you search for fiberglass If you search for rod, fiberglass rods, that's where you'll go. They're like uh, $7 for a five-foot rod. Nice. And the only difficulty is you can't really cut them with a regular saw because okay. fiberglass just frays. Right. You have to use a Dremel tool to cut through them. Okay. Which uh, makes sure you wear eye protection because the Dremel tool is at a real fast pace. And right this up. gets hot, and I've caught one on the bottom of my eye, and it burned for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So make sure you wear eye protection when you cut these. And sometimes, hopefully you cut a little better than I did here, but uh, <laughs> I was kind of in a hurry. But uh, what you want is a nice smooth cut. Right. So now I'll show you what some of the structures look like. Here's basically what the structure looks like. You can see the fiberglass rod in the back. It's a, one of the smaller, it's actually the middle of the size paving stones. Mm -hmm. For bigger tanks, you use bigger paving stones for stability. Smaller tanks, smaller stones. They come in uh, three or four different sizes. And basically what you want to do is, like I said, cut on an edge and have different sizes and angles, and then you build off of this. So once I'm going to place four of these structures in this tank and then put some loose rock around it, and basically that'll be it. Very good. Okay. Let's get started.
over top. Hopefully. And then you have a nice yeah, solid look cave. Yep, yeah, look at that. Now, for, for this particular rock, how long did you have it kind of... It's been curing for three weeks. So it's three weeks. When you cut through live rock, mm -hmm. sometimes when you're drilling through, it'll break into a thousand pieces. Right, right. This, you can really go on the edges of it to get a nice difference of it. Right. So from that standpoint, it's good. And now, did you order it online? Did you make it? No, I got it. At, I got, actually got it from Brian at Wet Pets. There you go. I try to uh, get as much stuff as I can from local... Because I right. still, you know, they're my friends and I've been dealing with them. Right. So I primarily deal with uh, Brian at Wet Pets or Jeff at Aqua World. Right. For those of you who don't know, that's in Pittsburgh, PA. And I'm just going to go get some more loose pieces to put on here. But for the most part, you don't only want it to be a half to two-thirds of the way up and let okay. the corals grow to the surface. I mean, in the old days, we used to build it all the way to the surface. Right, right. Now we do a lot lower. And then I'm going to put uh, a rag of live sand on the bottom. And once I do that, you won't see most of the rock. You won't see the bricks on the bottom. So is there any particular theme that you kind of go through when, you, when you're laying out? Because like you said, you had a feel for it. But what, what do you like when you're... When I, I try to make it as open as I can, but I also try to have overhangs, caves, things so that there's... Even though this is going to be small fish, right. there's places for all of them. Because right. uh, like some of the gobies like to be underneath a rock that's sitting in the sand, right. things like that. You, you try to give them a cave close to the ground. Right. So over here, the rock is sitting real low, so yeah. they'll burrow underneath that. And I'll probably put a couple pieces of rock, but one of the advantages of using the system is you don't have rock sitting on the substrate, so you don't get the detritus buildup that right. you typically would. I mean, it's sitting on it, but it's not one big flat piece down on the substrate. It's just a real thin portion, because it's basically being held up by the... Uh, by the uh, uh, fiberglass rods. Right, right. And the fiberglass rods are out a little bit, mm -hmm. but you're really not going to see those once I put the corals right. in a live rock around. I mean, the corals will actually grow over those. Right. I mean, if I want to get real picky, I'll go in with a Dremel tool and take those off. Right. But it's not really worth it. Yeah. It's going to give you something to lean the coral off so the fish don't knock it over. Yeah. But I've also have it away from the glass so there's space to clean. Because one of the things that you'll find is the closer you have the rock to the glass, the more uh -huh. likely you are to get algae growing on the rock, <laughs> on the glass. So right, you want right. to leave yourself space. Like I don't have quite enough space here, so I got to move this over a hair. And like I said, this is only like 50 pounds of rock yep. in a 75, which is a lot less rock than what I used to have done. Right. Yeah, the two pound per... And I'd love to tell you that this is coral and algae, but they actually dye the rock purple. Ah, oh, that's cool, though. But it always stays purple. see anything leaking out of the tank, so that's always a good thing. <laughs> no, I water tested the tank, even though it's only been offline for six months. Right. Just to make sure nothing happened. Plus, I wanted to test out the overflow. Right.
Okay, Mike, so I see we got the water flowing now, right? We have the water flowing back in with pulsating, which you can see on the top. All right. But I'm also putting one power head in now, and I'll probably put a second power head in later. Because uh, one of the things that most people don't understand is flow is one of the most critical things to the long-term success of a tank. Because corals are basically pre-designed to draw stuff in, not have stuff taken off of them. Mm -hmm. So if detritus or bacteria or something lands on them, they don't really have a mechanism for getting rid of it easily. Right. They rely on the ocean current to do that. Right. So one of the things, even in a small tank, that you want is good flow. So even though this is primarily going to be an LPS tank, right. where they don't really come from areas of good flow and they have somewhat of a means for removing uh, detritus and other stuff, right. still good to have current within there. Because what I'm trying to do is keep the detritus stirred up as long as I can. goes up through the overflow down and gets skimmed out keeps the tank a lot cleaner. If you just let it settle down, then you're constantly having to clean the sand and clean the detritus off the bottom. And since this is going to have sand in it, but I will have sand sifting starfish and things like that in it mm -hmm. to keep the sand clean, but I am going to have at least one and probably two power heads in here eventually. And now what's your goal as far as turnover, you know, as far as circulation turnover, not filter turnover? Circulation, I try to have it like anywhere between five and ten times per hour. Okay. Because uh, it used to be you'd run as much water as you could, but you were running it through a trickle filter. Right. Now that you're running it through a protein skimmer, the question is do you want a nice slow flow so the protein skimmer has time to really accumulate the waste. Right. If you run it too fast, it doesn't really allow it time to accumulate waste, so it doesn't skim quite as well. Sure. A slower flow seems to work better with some of the, or, and you can get out a, a significantly larger portion of the d dissolved organics right. and other material. Right. So, and with flow within the tank, I try to have it be anywhere from 10 to 20 times what the flow is. Okay. So this is a 75 gallon tank, 750 to 1500 gallons would be perfect. Perfect. So now, okay, so we talked flow. Let's talk a little bit about lighting as well, okay? Um, so what do you have on there as far as the units go and wattages and all that stuff? These are just, these are just two uh, uh, Aqua Illuminator Soul units. Mm -hmm. They're Soul versus white because in addition to having a white LED, they have a blue and they have a royal blue. Okay. So for bringing out the colors, greens, blues, purples, they're really good. Uh, for pinks and reds, not so much. Mm -hmm. But it still gives a nice color and they're totally uh, controllable. Mm -hmm. You can go from 0% bulb and you can ramp them up. Uh, you can even have them do thunderstorms or lightning storms because there's really All no right. thunder in the ocean. <laughs> but lightning so that you'll get a, a flash of light across the tank, which uh -huh. is you know kind of a fun thing to do within the tank. But you know, right, And what's, what's funny is people are always worried to startle the fish. Well, the fish are exposed to this somewhat all the time. So right. uh, looking at it online, I really haven't seen them get startled too much. I mean, I Still haven't really taken the time to learn the controller because I've just had the lights on for a day or two. Right. So as soon as I get everything programmed, that's one of the things I will be playing with more. Okay, and so now the, the, the unique thing about here as well is, okay, the basically the mounting that you did. Right? Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I custom built the mounts because these are designed with two screws on either end of the fixture to slide into the uh, uh, rigging that they made. But I wanted these to run parallel to the tank because it's longer rather than wide. And since I'm only running two on it, I wanted them to be parallel and also to sit back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I custom did this by cutting some aluminum uh, L-bar right. to fit on and drilled through that for the hole to go up. But then I also mounted these. Instead of mounting them sideways, I put uh, pieces of steel that I cut across either side to make it, allow them to run parallel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't that hard of a job. It took a little bit of doing, but... Uh, now I can move these, slide these up and down as I want, and I can raise or lower this as I want. Because I also use these angle irons that I got at a horticulture supply store that they, uh, they use for hanging lights to grow tomatoes. But for a coral tank, this is perfect, and I think this is, looks a lot better than hanging it from the ceiling. Yeah. Plus, I don't get the sway when you have that long expenditure of uh, <laughs> nylon or of uh, cable going to the roof. Because right. here it's only five or six inches, and I can move this up or down. Right now, these are about 15 inches above the water surface. I'll move them down about another three. Mm -hmm. But since I was putting stuff in the tank today, I wanted to leave a little bit more space. Right. But with this, you get a nice dispersion, and I don't know what the par is yet. I have a par meter, and... Later on, as this comes down and as I play with this, I'll check what the par levels are to get a better idea, but that will also tell me where I can put some corals. Sure. Because, sure. I mean, you want to have 100, 150, 200 par down at the bottom to put corals on the bottom, mm -hmm. and I don't see these having any problem with that. Right. Basically, we're day one of setup. I mean, this yep. is where you want to be. You have all the technical equipment up and running. Uh, tank isn't leaking, which is always a good thing. 
Uh, you can hear how quiet it is. I mean, the only thing you hear is a gradual slurping of the return. Right. And I'm going to raise the water level up a hair even to reduce that down. But other than that, there's no real sound coming from this tank. You don't hear the blur of uh, fans on these lights, right. which is nice. Uh, I don't have to run a chiller, which is even nicer, right. saves electricity. But I'm going to give this a week to for the rock to cure, for everything to settle down. I'll do a 40-gallon water change in this tank to take out anything residual in the water. Yep. And next time, a week from now, after I do the water change, we'll have the live sand, we'll have the GFO and carbon reactor. Uh, I'll add a controller. Mm -hmm. I'll add a t water top-off system. And then the system will basically be self-running. Yep. Yep. So from there on, uh, a week after that, I can start adding corals and fish. And then this tank's good to go for hopefully the next five years. So <laughs> from start to finish, it takes about five weeks to get this up and running to the point where I want it to. Right. So five weeks for about five years, not a bad trade -off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Now, are you going to start adding any little critters in in the meantime? or are you going to? I will probably throw some of the snails and some of the hermits in just to make sure this water is good. Yep, yep. And then when I do the water change, I'll add a bunch more to it and make sure they're healthy because if the snails and crabs are okay right. then it's pretty much good for everything else. So it sounds like you've been burned by that before. In other words, it's a good idea to test the water before you do it? Just because I've, I've, in the old days I used to try a lot more experimentation. I tried different salts and different sure. additives and stuff sure. and some of the animals are not real happy with some of those salt mixes. Right, right. But since I basically use the same salt mix I'm pretty sure that this is going to be very stable. I'm not going to have a problem. Right. But just in case, I also want to make sure that the temperature is right. I've got to add a heater to the bottom, keep the tank between 76 and 78, Yep. and from there, uh, basically a pretty nice stable system, because the one thing you want with a reef tank is to be as stable as possible. Right. The more stable you are, the faster the corals grow. So uh, that's one of the things you have to keep in account as the corals get bigger. They tend to consume more, so stable at one week is different than stable <laughs> at one year, so you've got to keep track of these things. So one thing I do suggest, as soon as you set it up, set up a log. Keep track of all the parameters, temperature, pH, salinity, uh, magnesium, calcium, phosphate, nitrate. And from there, you can see if there's a problem long before it becomes a major problem. Right. So that helps a lot when you're starting out to say, okay, my calcium is dropping a little bit every week. You need to know you have to add more calcium than what you've been adding. Or, you know, uh, your nitrate levels are way up. What's going on? You find out that your skimmer really isn't working that well anymore. I mean, we tend to take things for granted that it's working. But a lot of times, yeah, that's right. It, that's not the case. That's right. Well, perfect. Then what we'll do is we'll come back uh, next week and we'll kind of get going from there. Sounds great. Thanks again, Mike.